Okay, so I'm going to talk about uh, dislocation subluxation management, um, or as I like to call it, I'm just popping out for a while. <laughs> so, I think a good place to start when talking about dislocations and subluxations is actually looking at the difference between what they are. So, a dislocation basically is a displacement of a bone, according to the Oxford English Dictionary, its def dictionary definition is a displacement of a bone from its natural position in the joint. So this is where the two bones that form a joint completely separate from each other, come right apart. So a couple of examples here. So we've got the shoulder. Um, so if one well, of the cursors disappeared, I've got a little pointer there. Wait for a cursor, so, not to worry. Um, as you can see there in the shoulder, you can see the, the head of the humerus has come straight out the back of the glenoid. Yeah. Yeah. So it's a posterior dislocation of the shoulder, so it slipped fully out of the glenoid fossa. So it's a very clear, full dislocation. And then if we take the example there of an elbow, as you can see, quite, quite clear to see that you've got a posterior dislocation of the elbow there. So there's no real ambiguity. And I think, to be fair, if you dislocate and if you fully dislocate, you pretty much know about it. There's, there's no real ambiguity. That joint is right out and it's quite clear, even visibly quite clear to see. So that's a dislocation. What's a subluxation? Well, according to Collins English Dictionary, it's to partially dislocate. So um, this is where a joint just doesn't fully come out of its socket, just partially slips. So it's a bit of a slippage. So we've got an example here of a knee. So we've got a lateral displacement of the patella where it's gone sideways. So you can see the outer lining of where it should be sitting. So it's slipped. And then again, we've got the shoulder. So we've got an inferior subluxation of the shoulder where it's slipped downwards out of its joint. So it's not fully out, it's just partially out. And a lot of people often um, talk about their joints clicking or slipping or they feel like they're dislocating and a lot of the time it's these little partial subluxations, these little slippages that they feel where the joint sort of moves and slips around. So dislocations and subluxations, they can happen in any joint but some are more common than others. Um, here's a shoulder which is uh, a very common one. Um, as you can see that doesn't quite look right. Um, and there's a knee. Now, I don't know about you, but that, that shouldn't really be sitting there, should it? <laughs> yeah. Um, so, as mentioned, these can happen in any joints. So some um, are more common than others. Shoulders, knees, thumbs. So, carpal metacarpal joint in your thumb, sort of at the base of it. Um, and ankles tend to be amongst some of the most common um, joints to dislocate. I shouldn't have shown you that just straight after lunch, really, should I? <laughs> so why does this happen? Um, well, there are several reasons why this happens, um, and probably the most common reason is connective tissue. Now, I'm going to teach you to suck eggs here. This is stuff that all you guys know already. Connective tissue, as you know, it supports and binds you together. It forms a framework for your body, and in particular, it makes up ligaments and tendons. And ligaments and tendons are the passive structures in your body around your joints that act like little guy ropes. So these are the little things that connect between bones and they stop the joints generally coming apart. So as your joints start to move apart, as the bones start to gap a bit, um, these ligaments should start to get taut and tight. And usually they would stop those joints coming apart and stop the dislocation. So, just to remind you, um, tendons, these connect muscle to bone. So, at the end of a muscle, you've got a tendon that connects to a bone made of collagen. Ligaments connect bone to bone. And again, these are like these little guy ropes that get tight and stop them coming apart. And we've got an example here in the knee. So, you can see you've got um, medial collateral ligament there. And you've got um, a patella tendon there. And also, in your joints, you've got something called a joint capsule. So this is like a sleeve of tissue, almost like a bag that sits around the joint, it encapsulates that joint. Um, and again, this is a connective tissue structure, and this is another passive structure 
that acts to hold that joint in place to stop it dislocating or subluxing. Now, you guys know all about collagen. Collagen is the main structural protein of the various connective tissues in the body, and an alteration in the collagen type causes the connective tissues to be more lax, more stretchy, hypermobile. So the collagen, which makes up ligaments and tendons in hypermobile patients, is more stretchy, it's more lax, okay? So you've got that extra laxity. So that means you've got laxity in the joint capsule as well because the joint capsule is also made of collagen. And so as a result of that, this extra laxity of the ligaments of the joint capsule means that joints are potentially less stable because instead of those structures holding the joints in place, getting tight, getting taut, that stretchability, that laxity, allows for those joints to be able to separate and to dislocate. This is one of the main reasons why this happens. But there are also other reasons as well. So sometimes you can get dislocations as a result of altered muscle tone. Um, muscle fatigue can lead to dislocations. So if your muscles are tired, and normally they're working to try and hold, you, hold your joint stable, they get tired and fatigued, then your joint can slip out of place. And actually alter muscle tone, you may well find you have an alteration in your muscle tone when you sleep. So as you fall asleep, your body relaxes, and then sometimes you find that your, in particular, your shoulders might whoop, slip out of place because your muscle tone has relaxed as you've fallen asleep, and then you wake up with a dislocation. Um, then there's muscle patterning. This is another reason why uh, people dislocate. Um, again, probably one of the most common areas for this to happen is in the shoulder. So in, the, in and around the shoulder, what you often find, or what I often find when I see uh, EDS patients, is that they've got overactivity of their pectoralis major muscle or their latissimus dorsi muscle. And these muscles are working more than they should do. And what happens is they connect to the head of the humerus, to the ball, and they exert a pulling force. So if your pec's overactive and it's connected to the front, it will pull the joint out of place. Or the lats will connect up, and if they're overactive and working more than they should, then they can pull the joint out of place. So this muscle patterning is another big reason why um, joints can sometimes dislocate. Um, muscle spasm a major reason why, um, why, why joints dislocate. So muscles suddenly just bunch up, tighten up, spasm, and again, exert a pulling force, and also act as a, a, a preventative measure from that joint being able to get its way back in again. And stress is another reason uh, why joints can sometimes slip out or dislocate. <clears throat> Impaired proprioception. So as we've heard already from a few speakers, Proprioception is the awareness of joint position sense. It's where your joints are in space. Um, and we know that uh, EDS patients have impaired proprioception. So they have that lack of awareness of where their joints are, which is why you're often clumsy. You'll walk into tables, into doorways, knock things over, yeah? because you don't have a good sense, a good awareness of where you are and where, you're spa and, and where you are in space and how much pressure and things to use. Yeah? Um, and also, that means sometimes that you'll lock your joints into hyperextended positions because that's how you get feedback to your brain about where your joints are. But if you're taking your joints to excess ranges, then that puts them at a greater risk of slipping out of place. Um, traumatic incidents, you can suffer them just the same as everybody else. Traumatic incidents are the main reasons why those of us without hypermobility would dislocate. So, you know, high impact sports, road traffic accidents, all that kind of stuff. Um, again, these things can happen to you guys too. And then repeated overstretching, too many party tricks. Oh, yeah, so this is a classic again. So all you guys who are saying, look, look, look where I can take my shoulders or my legs. And Dr. Frank Amano uh, in her talk the other day spoke about a, a patient of hers that used to wrap her leg all the way around the back of her body and her foot was sort of poking out the other side. You know, doing that's not good because you're just constantly stretching, okay? I know it seems like amazing to do and everything, and it is amazing to see, truly, but um, don't do it, okay? So here's a couple of examples of party tricks. We have Captain Frodo here who moves his body through a tennis racket. 
Do you reckon he's hypermobile? What do you think? Yeah. Um, and then we had the snake man um, who used to entertain French soldiers in 1915. So literally just hanging himself over this wooden bar. Okay. So all those of you that are thinking you might have a career with Cirque du Soleil as a contortionist or whatever, forget it. So the joint comes out. Um, for some people, this is a regular occurrence. Sometimes it can happen once a week, sometimes once a day, sometimes once an hour, sometimes once every five minutes. And I've had patients in my clinic rooms who, in the space of a 30-minute consultation, have dislocated in excess of 20 times. Um, and sometimes the joint will just pop out and it will pop back again. It will find its way back again. And if that happens, phew, fantastic, great, what a relief, good. But even if that happens, and even if it's a regular occurrence for you, you still need to see if you can try and stop this happening or reduce the frequency of this happening in the future. So just because it goes out and it goes in doesn't mean that that's what you want going on all the time. Because even if it happens, it can still be very, very painful. But what happens if it doesn't go back in? Yeah, that's what normally happens. So people will often panic. The joint slips out of place, then they'll hit the panic button. It's understandable. It's painful, it's distressing, it's a very normal response. But what happens well, if you panic? Sometimes people will you know, pick up the phone, ring for the ambulance. Well, they won't pick up the phone if they've dislocated their shoulder. Someone else will do it, maybe. But um, they'll call for an ambulance, rush off to the emergency room, and try and get sorted out there. This is not a great way to manage the situation, OK? So if you're a recurrent dislocator, and you have to keep going backwards and forwards to the emergency room, this is poor management. You want to take control of the situation. Because what happens in emergency rooms? Well, a lot of the time, um, if they're not already sick of the sight of you and treat you badly, which is a really bad thing to do, I know, but that's what they can be like. Um, sometimes they'll just try and yank, forcibly yank the joint back into place, um, which is, again, obviously incredibly painful. Um, or, in order to combat that pain, sometimes they'll actually give you a, a, an anaesthetic, a general anaesthetic, anaesthetic sometimes, and then they'll pop that joint back into place. But then what happens when you come out of that general anaesthetic? Your muscles just freak out, and then, boom, the joint comes straight back out again because that muscle force is exerting uh, a pressure to pull the joint back out of place again. So. Sometimes I've known, um, particularly with knees, dislocating patellas, um, sometimes uh, patients have gone to the emergency room with uh, a dislocating patella and they've put it back in place and it's slipped back out and they've put it back and it's slipped out and then they thought, okay, what we'll do is we'll, we'll put a cast around this knee. So they'll actually put you in a full leg cast and that is a terrible situation, okay, because you've got a muscle battle going on underneath that cast, um, and this is a really bad situation. So emergency rooms are really not a great place to go when you suffer dislocations or subluxations. I know it's an, a, an understandable course of action, but let's try and move away from that if we can. So this is what you should do, okay? So when you panic, when you dislocate, if you panic, panic leads to more stress. Okay? Again, I hold my hands up. It's perfectly understandable to panic. Your joints come out of place. It's incredibly painful. It's incredibly distressing. You're going to panic about it. But if you panic, that increases stress. What does stress do? It increases muscle tone, causes more muscle spasms. More muscle spasms will pull the joint out of place and stop that joint from being able to find its way back in again because you're trying to battle against that overactive muscle. The, the overactive muscle spasms, in turn, lead to more pain. More pain leads to more panic. More panic leads to more stress, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And so you end up with a less chance of resolving the dislocation, okay? So you need to try to get past that whole panic situation. So what should you do? How do you manage this situation? Breathe, okay? So, the first thing you need to do is take some slow, deep, relaxed breaths. Your joint's dislocated, it's out, it's painful, it's distressing. Just try and stay calm, try and breathe, okay? Chill. 
ja? So, try using some relaxation techniques. If any of you have ever used those before, slow, relaxed, deep breathing, uh, mindfulness, these can be really, really useful ways of trying to breathe and relax. What next? Use painkillers. I'm not a monster, I know it hurts, okay? So, if you've got painkillers, use them appropriately though, okay? So, don't overdose. Never take more than you should, okay? So only take the dosage indicated by your prescriber. I can't emphasize that strong enough, strongly enough, okay? So don't take more than su the suggested dose, but don't suffer unnecessarily either, okay? Don't be a martyr. Don't say, oh, you know, I'll deal with it, I'll be okay. If you've got pain relief, use it, take it. That's what it's there for. I mean, my goodness me, if you, if you, you know, joints dislocated, then if you don't use painkillers then, then when, when are you supposed to use them, yeah? So, if you've got painkillers, if you've got analgesia, take it, use it. Next, support the joint, okay? So this joint that's come out of place, um, if possible, if you've got pillows or a sling, if it's a shoulder, you can uh, use a sling. If it's a knee or a hip, you can use pillows. Um, so try and support that joint, take the pressure off of it. So you take the pressure off the surrounding muscles of the joints, yeah, that gives them something to relax into. And that's the key to it, letting those muscles relax, okay? So use supports, use pillows, use cushions, use whatever you can to support that joint. Find a comfortable resting position whilst you're using your relaxed breathing, okay? This allows the muscles to relax and stop spasming because again, this is the real key to it, okay? This whole getting control of the muscle situation. What next? Try heat, okay? So again, if we've got a overactive, spasming type muscle situation because of a joint dislocation, then often heat can be quite a good way of allowing those muscles just to relax. So in whatever form or whatever method works for you, whether it be hot water bottles, wheat bags that you put in microwaves, a warm bath, anything, um, heat can be a really helpful way of, um, of relaxing overactive muscles. What else can we do? Well, distraction. Um, Understandably, if your joints come out of place, um, it's gonna be the sole focus of your attention. If it's the sole focus of your attention, you're gonna panic about it, you're gonna stress about it, the situation's gonna just you know, revolve again like I was talking about earlier. So if possible, not easy, again, I hold my hands up, I know none of this stuff is easy, okay? But if you can do, try and change your focus of attention away from it for a while. So listen to some music, watch a film, talk to friends, listen to a relaxation CD, whatever works for you. Something just to distract your focus of attention away from that horrible, painful, um, dislocated or sublux joint. Um, and it can be really helpful as well, obviously, as a short-term pain relieving strategy because you know, your mind will be focused on something else. And believe me, the power of the brain over um, pain can be an absolutely unbelievable thing. And what else can you do? Well, if you've tried all those strategies that I've just mentioned, a bit of massage as well. So sometimes gentle massage, and I emphasize gentle, okay? Don't go vigorous, um, and try and do it yourself if possible, if you can reach the area, because you are in control of that situation, and you know how much pressure to apply that works for you, okay? So just gentle massage sometimes can help the muscles relax. And again, helping them relax enough for that joint to hopefully find its way back into place again. Okay? Sometimes if you get someone else doing it to you, they can be a bit too vigorous and then that can wind the whole situation up um, and make it harder for the joints to go back in. So a little bit of gentle massage yourself to help relax the joints, uh, to help relax the muscles rather, it should hopefully help the joint find its way back. So the six key principles of management, okay? Breathe. Use painkillers, support the joint, try heat, distraction, and gentle massage, okay? Work your way through these. It's not easy, again, I hold my hands up, I know that, it's really not easy, but 
it's definitely doable, and I know it works because I've used it with my patients. So what's the idea about it? Well, the main aims about those six strategies, again, are just to stay calm in the situation, okay? To stay calm, to keep on top of the pain, in turn, allowing those muscles to relax. That's the key to it, okay? So if a joint's out, there's no reason, theoretically, why it shouldn't be able to find its way back in again, okay? It came out, it should be able to go back in. Nobody suddenly inserted an iron bar in, in its place or a big block of bone to stop it going in again, okay? So if it found its way out, should be able to find its way back in again, okay? So it's like a kid who sticks his head through the railings and then suddenly panics and thinks, oh, I can't get out. If it went through, it should be able to come back again, okay? And the main reason why it doesn't come back and why the fire brigade have to be called is because of the panic, yeah? The head hasn't suddenly grown twice the size. It's panic, right? So if you can keep cool, relax, it should find its way back again, all right? But what if it doesn't? And sometimes it doesn't. Um, I think the first thing is not to expect the joint to go straight back in. And this is a real key one as well, okay? So a very common response when a joint comes out of place is to expect that joint to go back in again as quickly as possible. And people are really keen and really eager and perfectly understandably to want that joint to get straight back in again, okay? Um, and it's not unusual though for joints to remain out of place for several hours or days, days and days and days. Um, but once it's out, it's out. It's not going further out, okay? It's already out. So again, don't panic, okay? So when should you get help? When should you go to the hospital? When is it appropriate to, well, not so much panic, but to start seeking other assistance? Well, if your limb starts to change color due to a, a lack of blood supply, then that would obviously be an appropriate time to go to the hospital. Or if your limb goes completely numb and it's like dead and you think, oh, this is not a good situation, then it's a good, uh, good time to seek attention. Um, or if you've tried the six key strategies that I mentioned and you've given it an adequate period of time and you're still really, really struggling and you're getting very, very distressed, then that's perhaps another time to get some uh, external help. But as I mentioned, if you go to ER, it's not unusual for them to relocate your joint for it just to pop straight back out again or when the anaesthetic wears off, okay? So bear that in mind. It's much better, much, 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 much better if you can deal with this situation yourself. So what about damage? People often worry about damaging their joints when these incidents occur. Um, it's highly unlikely. Uh, your joint laxity, the fact that you have this laxity, allows for these incidents to happen. You know, it's one of the reasons why they happen, but it also allows for them to happen. So, um, you know, in, in the normal population who have a traumatic incident and have a dislocation, they should panic. That's not a good situation, okay? So they're likely to uh, rupture ligaments, to, you know, rip off lumps of cartilage and all kinds of things, okay? Because their joints just don't have the capacity to go to those ranges. But you guys have that laxity. So most of the time when you have a dislocation or a subluxation, you're not really damaging yourself, okay? There may be tiny bits of microtrauma that go on um, and you know, that, that can happen, but by and large, um, you don't generally damage yourself, but it is just mostly distressing and unpleasant. So a good thing to do after you've had one of these incidents is to then learn the lessons of it, to try and reflect on it. So once everything's back in place and the situation's calmed down, then learn lessons. So reflect on it. Were you moving in a way that normally causes the joint to dislocate? Did you move without thinking? What was your posture like? Were you tired? Were you overdoing it? Were you stressed about something? Think back. What was it that you did that caused that to happen in the first place? And obviously, try and learn from that. Try not to repeat that mistake. Um, and prevention is obviously better than cure. So I think working with physiotherapists to learn to control muscles and use the right ones is a really important way of reducing the frequency of these incidences. So if you've got a whole muscle patterning issue going on around your shoulder, for example, then learning to 
switch on the right muscles and switch off the wrong ones can help reduce the incidences of these things happening. So um, physiotherapy is a really important aspect of it. Uh, rehab to improve proprioception, so to start to develop that awareness of where your joints are. And this can be trained, you can do that, yeah? So, you know, it's, it's a process that you can work through, but trust me, you can improve your proprioception. And by doing so, again, you can reduce the amount of times that this happens. Um, possible use of supports or braces if required. Now, I'm not the world's biggest advocate of supports and braces generally, per se, because I think if you're one of those people that wears a brace constantly, and I'm not saying there isn't a role for it, but you just have to be aware of the fact that um, your muscles then become reliant on that passive structure and can often get um, a lot weaker um, and also it can influence um, your proprioceptive awareness as well. So I think sometimes you can become um, weaker and less stable in that joint if you constantly rely on a brace to support that joint. So then when you take that brace off, your muscles have got um, you know, more deconditioned, um, more unstable, and then you're more likely to get those incidences occurring. And then what happens is you put the brace on again and you keep the brace on because you're worried about that situation happening, but then that just self-perpetuates, okay? So much better to try to work on building stability, okay? So building stability around joints is the key. Um, Strength, not so much, um, although strength is also really important, but stability is the key. So working on building stability around those unstable joints. Um, and trying to manage stress and anxieties as well is also um, another really helpful preventative measure. Um, I've avoided talking about surgery um, as a preventative measure. Um, it's quite a controversial area. Um, people often ask about you know, whether they should have surgeries and stabilizations and things like that. Um, by and large, I would usually caution against it. Um, I think it's a very dangerous road to tread, um, especially for those in the hypermobile community, um, to start having stabilization surgeries and fusions and these kinds of things. Um, as you're all probably aware, they're... Um, the success rates of some of these things is, is really quite poor. Um, and I've known people, for example, to have um, capsular shifts, capsular shrinkages, and um, things like that in their shoulders. But bear in mind your collagen type. Um, what's going to happen is, for a while, that will be great, and that will feel tighter, and that will hold everything in place. But over time, sometimes that laxity starts to return and then you start to get that joint dislocating again and then you've got scar tissue on top of a dislocating joint and then you're in a, a pretty tricky situation. Um, same thing with things like lateral releases of, of um, dislocating knees, etc. So tread very carefully um, if you're considering um, going down a, a surgery route. I'm not saying that there isn't a role for it, and sometimes there is. Sometimes um, if uh, dislocations are happening um, with such prevalence, then sometimes there are no other alternatives. But by and large, be very, very careful before you make that move. So in summary, the main thing to do in these situations is to stay calm, okay? So the more you stay calm and the more you can manage it yourself, the easier it should get each time, okay? So if you work through those six principles that I spoke about, and you actually manage to get the joint back in place having done those six principles, then you know that you can do it. And once you know you can do it, then that means that you know the next time it happens, you can do it again. And usually, you can do it again a little bit quicker and a little bit more efficiently. And each subsequent time, you'll get better and better and more efficient at getting that joint back into place again. And I promise you, you can get control of this situation. Okay? So I've worked with many patients who have thought there's no way they will ever get these under control. But I promise you, it is possible. It can be done. So good luck with that.